we're sitting here with Grant Hart, and Grant is, is many things to many people. Um, most notably, a former ice cream man and yeah. uh, and uh, pitcher well, for the One for thing the I really like to shove down people's throats is that I was in Husker Du for a while. I did not know that. Yeah, it, uh, well, it's part of my past that has been kind of buried by my other accomplishments. Now, was that a rock and roll band of that some That was kind? a rock and roll band um, of the, the you know, punk genre, yeah. Okay, I think I know that. Yeah, we were on a, on a label for a while, that uh, um, little independent thing, SST Records, that was out of California. And uh, um, kind of, uh, if anybody knows the Rollins Band, well, then, you know, they, they know all about this milieu. This crazy kind of thing. So yeah. does it ever kind of get on your nerves, like... You know, how many years has it been since Hoosker's been over? It was half my life ago that, uh, you know, I accomplished, you know, the the gravestone accomplishment, you know. Yeah. The, um, it guarantees your New York Times obituary? It guarantees your New York Times obituary. Which, which, is, which is swell, but you've certainly gone on and done stuff. I always kind of wonder about, like, does it just got to get to that point where it's like, yeah, 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 that was... 20 years ago, and it was 20 great years ago, but, you know, now you've made, you know, a million records since, you know. Yeah, you've I done mean, when you're in a room full of 40-year-old people and you're playing music, um, then it's a whole nother thing. You're, you know, you're, you're touching bases. I try not to make it a, you know, any kind of a reunion thing. I mean, it's not a deliberate thing. It's just natural, but, uh, um, you know, a combination of the annoyance and then the the deep satisfaction when people come up to you with tears welling up in their eyes saying, you know, such and such was, you know, my late husband's and my song or, you know, so it's like anything, it's uh, a give and take. It, it's got to be a little tough to know that your, that your records have been used to uh, conceive children, um, <laughs> you know. And then, uh, you know, you, you get letters from people with a photograph of a baby and it's like, his name is Grant, you know, and it's like, well, what the hell do you want me to do about it? People, have, strangers have named yeah. their children. Yeah, well, strangers in as much as, like, they know the music, but. But, yeah, not people, yeah. you know, not people you have lunch with. But at the same time, I mean, that's got to be kind of cool. It's also got to be kind of hard to keep a sense of ego about that, because I'll tell you that if people started naming their children after me, I'd be like, Yes. I'm the person you name children after. <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm the kid man. But that's that's got to be weird sometimes, especially when um, you know you're just trying to you know, get a sandwich. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have we have the advantage that we we didn't realize at the time or do it deliberately, but we didn't make like, you know, we weren't you know cover boy looking guys so we never put our faces on the covers you know you know we never tried to be you know personalities outside of the music but it is annoying when uh, you know say you you're just an asshole I mean is this okay yeah okay you, you're just an asshole but people think you're an asshole because you're a rock star it's yeah. true, you, you don't need a reason to be an asshole. Yeah, I don't need a reason to be an asshole. Well, it, it's kind of funny. I, in fairness, I have to admit that, we, you know, I've known you for like 20 years, and up until this moment, it never actually dawned on me, well, you're kind of famous. It, <laughs> I mean, apparently it's true. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, I just don't think about that stuff. Well, Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul yeah. has a real weird way of supporting local artists. Um, I, I would compare it to the, the you know, the, the old, uh, the tallest poppy in the garden gets lopped off or whatever, but uh, take Dave Perner, for example. Like, the guy has endured so much press cruelty that didn't exist before Soul Asylum had a big hit. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you know, Is rock it, star. 
it's a whole different view. I, I was just actually recently in Canada, and I was in a comic book shop, um, as I'm prone to be, mm -hmm. and I was having a conversation with um, one of the, uh, with the owner, and he's like, oh, where are you from? I'm from Minneapolis, and he's like, starts telling me stories about Dave Perner actually uh, coming in, and for those of you who don't know, Dave Perner's the singer of Soul Asylum, uh, with Winona Ryder, and, and this became like one of the high points in his, in his life. This was this moment for this guy. This, this was this was this moment. This this like, you know, ten minute moment of him telling me all the soul asylum moments of his life. You know, it's like one of those things where it's like for me, I'm just smiling, nodding, and mm -hmm. and from Minneapolis. Yeah, I'm like, yes, yes, I'm. Those those are people I'm aware of. Yes. Yeah. And they're they're, they're just people. You know, it, it's just not a thing, but it, it is that transformative thing of music, you know, where it's like, you know, there's a song that, that it, you know, Grave Dancers Union was like the record of his life. And I mean, that's amazing and great and impactful, but at the same time, it's, 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 there's that real world of, you know, here's the real world, your guy eating a sandwich, and then that Matrix world where, you know, Kanunu Reeves has talent. <laughs> What, uh, what can be really frustrating is when uh, however many hours of your life are represented by maybe seven hours of music and sometimes those seven hours, I mean, you want them to be, you know, you want that, when the tape's running, you want that to be the best hour of the day you, you, or the best performance of that song. I mean, you're capturing something here. And, uh, you know, the, the whole build up towards that and the, you know, inadvertent things that, you know, stumble you along the way. And, you know, the artist sometimes hears the compromises rather than what the listener, you know, the purchaser sure. hears. Um, Stuff that the consumer, I, sorry kids, um, would never notice because they're hearing something for the first time. Right. The magician only sees the trick. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody else sees the magic. And then other magicians think they see the flaws. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, what I was a moment ago with the uh, frustration of that seven hours, uh, at one time Husker Du released a lengthy live album that I just detested it. It was everything that I thought a live album shouldn't be when I was growing up as far as like, I oh, will take this little bit from this concert, this little bit from this concert, and we'll put it together and try to make the audience think that it's this one seamless, spectacular, you know, mezzo forte. And uh, then you hear some bootleg tape that somebody sends you, you know, terrible quality, but it's capturing such a, a moment, you know, and you know, there's that sacrifice between pure sound quality and the performance quality and the, the spiritual quality. I mean, you can, you can be playing lousily, but, you know, the and making right. no, music, no musical sense, but the energy and the, the dynamic is spot on. To, to pay a compliment here is one of the things that I've always liked about, about your aesthetic and your, and your work is somewhat brutal honesty, uh, more so than most artists are willing to do, and, and a warts and all approach to it, where it's like, there are moments of beautiful ugliness that are just, mm -hmm. the, those tend to be my favorite points on the records, because it's kind of heartbreaking in, in, its, in its truth. Yeah, um, there's, been, there's been times where those elements have been lost by spending too damn much time in the studio um, by, you know, not spending time recording a lot of stuff, spending a lot of time recording 
very little stuff and you know arranging each each bead in the necklace you know so that it's perfect and you know that really makes the mistakes show up you know the, the things that you can't change and, and at the end of the day do we want it all played perfectly by computers there's some people that do and I guess they're my aesthetic enemy it's sort of strange and, and I'm kind of curious of your opinion on some of this is like the uh, you know this great punk rock preservation and reenactment society that we currently seem to live in yeah that that punk rock just doesn't seem to die and I think of this as the equivalent of like you know when I was a kid in the 80s if if kids were still dressing up as hippies you know that they were still wearing bell bottoms and having long hair and and talking about how great cream was not that cream wasn't great but but it's just sort of sort of strange well you have a lack of privacy with with kids today um, every every moment is electric you know, it's either a telephone or, you know, DVD recording, there is, and also, like, the, the eavesdropping upon any music scene. I mean, you, you, you go to a concert by, performed by 18-year-olds, and there'll be six kids holding up the photo phone, you know, and they will head towards erasing the blemishes rather than like just go up there and, and do it and let your hair hang out and tomorrow nobody will remember it because they were you know inebriated anyway or or what have you so it gets co-opted and diluted faster and you know what's really scary is one one grade school teacher can totally undo a million years of cultural development in humanity by, you know, this kid needs Ritalin. You know, could you imagine if Ritalin was around when the original punk rockers were growing up? Oh, yeah, you there would have, have been no it. punk rock. So the kids are being chemically castrated. talking about uh, the, uh, the identity a person assumes when they buy a particular brand of product. You know, you can't, even, you can't even borrow somebody else's car without borrowing pe people's perception of them while you're driving it. You know, and uh, people are more worried about the wardrobe than the person within. Um, and the the biggest detriment to you know new new great music is the the destruction of the thrift store i mean now it's ebay you know you bid on it instead of going out and you find something cool and you identify with it um, i always thought of that as being kind of like what johnny rotten was talking about as far as flowers in the dustbin um, take them home and you know plant them in the garden of your life. You know, guys like you and I probably grew up, I mean, Salvation Army, you know, digging for records. Mm -hmm. It was almost every weekend that I spent, you know, trying to find whatever weird thing. And mostly, you know, you're not going to find, you know, Ramones records. You were finding, you know, weird Les Baxter, Martin Denny records, yeah. things that now go on eBay for, you know, you know eight times the cost. Um, yeah. And, and it's strange, but at the same time... And meanwhile, you go to the thrift store, and there's nothing left but total shite. Because all the thrift store and eBay, all the uh, eBay people and vintage boutique people, which is kind of a thing of the past now as well, have come in and glommed up on everything. It's, it's true. Well, there was a time when it's like you'd find like a Claudine Langer record that you already had, and you'd move it to the front of the pile so somebody else could find it. Right. You know, it's like I was thought of that as good karma and now that's not a thing you would ever see somebody where it's like oh this has value no I'm now you go to diggers the uh, the goodwill and there are people that 
throw all the books in a shopping cart and cover it with a blanket and go through them one by one, checking the computerized price estimate of it. Totally blocking anybody else, you know. Um, 150 years ago, people were shot for fencing off the prairie, and that's exactly what these people are doing culturally. kind of wonder about is if thrift store culture has changed a little bit in the sense that it's no longer it's no longer analog it's digital I mean I'm amazed what I find kids listening to on the uh, you know what they what they're listing in the depth of knowledge the when other side of the coin is tremendous like, as well you know who who are you know Morton Subotnik fans because yeah. they saw a reference in a Band that they like their reference stereo lab they or got in the stereo lab and then hear built. about the existence of the 16 year old who's a Morton Subotnik fan because his enjoyment of Morton Subotnik is on the internet well it could be but I I tend to because I'm one of those people who goes out and asks questions of people constantly okay. I hear a lot of these stories of people who are like oh you know I'm finding this or they you know they're you know they're a rock guy who's, you know, they're all into Fallout Boy, but all of a sudden they discover John Cage. Yeah. And one thing I notice, at least, about, uh, about the kids today, not to complain These about them. These damn kids today. Is that there's a, there tends to be a, a um, the, there's this labeling. When we were growing up, punk rock was punk rock. You know, it, it was all the same. The goth kids saw the English beat. Well, you have, you have to put a, you know, file name. And now it's screamo, emo, you know, intelligent metal. Um, Farina. Yeah, all these many, many names that I. You made me. Th you made me think of something that might be uh, of some relevance here. We grew up, and you know, most of the punk rockers, except the ones that were forty when they started out, um, we were absorbing and had at our disposal the remnants of the baby boom and the surplus of everything that they discarded and a larger field from which this stuff was to you know to survive from now maybe part of it and it might lead to other factors maybe part of it with uh, developments of say the last 10 years in particular are because there's not that premium old stuff anymore. And maybe we're putting too much importance on, on ma the material crap, but you know, material crap is art supplies. But um, these kids today have less of that surplus to choose from. So the cool nudie shirt that we passed up 25 years ago because it had a tear on the sleeve now, somebody bids on it and, you know, gets it a little cheaper over the computer because they know how to sew, you know, and, c and can fix it up. But there's, they have to buy new stuff and reproduction old stuff. Well, the other thing is, I, I think that there's a couple distinct advantages kids today have, or disadvantages, rather, that kids today have, whereas, like, when we were growing up, there wasn't a hot topic. You couldn't go to the mall and go to the punk rock store. You know, it's you weren't going to be able to find your anarchy shirt made in, you know, made in China. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair, it became available in that respect, you know, not long after punk rock. Oh, you know, it I certainly mean, got trash commercialized and and right away. I mean, yeah. Xandra Rhodes was out, you know, the next week with, you know, gold, mm -hmm. gold safety pin earrings. And well, that. Malcolm McLaren and yeah, I Vivian. Mean, I mean, a good chunk of that was really based on commerce. I mean, yeah. the, the whole idea, really, of like the British punk rock, at least, is that's a sellout right from the get-go. Yeah. Which kind of, at the time, I used to, when I was a kid and angry, I would deny it and be like, no, no, it's true, it's real. And it's like, as I get older, I appreciate the irony. You know, mm -hmm. it makes me like it all the more. Well, and maybe it, uh, maybe it relieved a lot of tension because there wasn't the onus of the moment when you do sell out. If, 
you're presumed to have sold out and be on a money grab from the beginning, then nothing that you do can be condemned. You know, I mean, it's like stating the obvious if you make it obvious. Case in point, um, there is not a single development um, in the Husker Du litany that, you know, I remember putting on our first single. Oh, you guys have sold out. You know, oh boy, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. Very often when I'm, when I'm on the road, uh, people will come up and, you know, they'll be, they'll be surprised at their, how their preconception was, was shattered. It's like, wow, you're just sitting out here reading the newspaper. Or you're hanging out before the gig, you know, wondering what time it is to see if it's time to play yet. I mean, chances are, if the audience is identifying with what you're doing, the most interesting people at the gig or that, or that you run into during the day are going to be your fans. You know, it's, you're, you're not going to walk down to, you know, the, the chess club and, you know, s strike up a conversation. Or you could, but... Uh, Do they have chess clubs? On the road? Yeah. yeah. Well, once I stopped doing t-shirts, I started... The mobile chess club was... Uh, it was, was happening, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, probably because of my fascination with uh, Marcel Duchamp. But, uh, um, yeah, the, the best conversations, the, the most surprising or, you know, enlightening bits of information. Um, and the sense of it being worthwhile. If you go out and connect with them, I guess I'm a people person. Um, and it makes it that much more meaningful to them, especially if they're one of the people that like, you know, hey, my girlfriend got, uh, my girlfriend got pregnant and uh, now I know what that song Pink Turns to Blue is all about. <laughs> yeah. Kids coming up and talking about the home pregnancy test where it turns blue if you're pregnant or, yeah. you know, I've never taken one. I but, wouldn't uh, think. Total re channeling of the, the lyrics of that song. Yeah, that's not what I ever would have thought about. No. And, uh, you know, that it, it's nice to, you know, spin the index around. When we divide it up all the way up. We got cities, cities have their neighborhoods, and more there's a story I'd like you to tell about okay. uh, about how you guys did t-shirts we would uh, we would always bring the screens along because um, you couldn't eat t-shirts on the road but if you had some surplus funds if you had a good gig well go out and buy you know 50 or 100 t-shirts you got the screen and the ink and the time you know throw some together and you know for equipment, you know, basically the size of an amplifier or, or smaller. And um, because I would always feature what in business is called a loss leader. You make, or some people call it a, a gate crasher or a door buster. Something that gets people in the door. Well, this was my, the, the opposite in, in my concept. It was to get people out of the door without feeling bad because they couldn't afford the other t-shirt you know, have something that was like at the time five bucks, so you could sell a ten dollar t shirt, sell a five dollar t shirt. And uh, usually it was the, you know, you'd have the people buying, buying both of them. That wasn't the design, you know, that wasn't the intention, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't think anybody has ever hurt their, their volume by making the stuff affordable. Well, that's exactly it. You made it easy to be a fan, and I think that's one of the things. If the easier you can make it for someone to be your fan, the more likely it is that they will be. The music.
music critics, I mean, boy, how, how tough a job do they have? Well, first you have to, you know, be a drummer in a band, not have success at it, then, then you start writing it. Okay. I know about 15 critics who were all former drummers. Oh, man. Maybe drummers have a lot to complain about, you know, and they condense that hatred into a journalism career. Could be. Well, now, you're a drummer. Have you felt a need to uh, rip on records mm. and print? No. Never, never has occurred to me. But uh, I think drumming for me was kind of a, a compromise. There were three guys that wanted punk rock, and one of them owned a drum set. I was, uh, I'd been playing keyboards in, in bands up until that time. But uh, I wouldn't have had that any other way with that, with that group. Um, I'll tell you about the, the last couple days. Um, fellow that played live with Husker Du on a number of occasions, a, uh, uh, primarily a jazz saxophonist, his name is John Clegg. We're, uh, we're endeavoring to put out a official bootleg of some early live tapes of him uh, tootling along with us, uh, one from Duffy's, one from uh, Goofy's Upper Deck. So it's kind of nice because it's these two really obscure venues. Sure. I mean, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can say that they saw Husker Du at First Avenue or the entry, but, uh, you know, especially Duffy's, I mean, what an obscure punk rock landmark. That's, yeah, that's not a thing you're going to hear a lot of people yeah. talk about. The, um, Although, in fairness, I did have Kevin Second spit on me there. Really? It's true. You it's must my have been a wee lad. Uh, it was an all eight show. I was. Okay. Uh, it was just a. It was just. A was tiny. he spitting for fun? I believe so. Yes. <laughs> um, Recreational expectoration. It was. Uh, yeah. I was. I was very delighted. It was. Uh, Did you save it? No. Okay. No, but you uh, sold it. <laughs> no, I actually wiped it off. But for okay. a minute there, I was like, "Dude, Kevin Second spit on me." Yes. And that's the great thing about youth, because now I would just be annoyed. Right. You know, be like, ah. There was, um, it was a Wisconsin show, and it was for an encore. I believe Dave Perner went up and played the drums, and Bob was playing guitar, and maybe Mueller was playing bass. Obviously, they were on tour with Husker Du. And uh, they were playing, I believe it was Anarchy in the UK, you know, just the goofy cover song. And those of us who weren't, th those of us from the bands that weren't on stage started uh, demonstrating, you know, similarly cliche punk rock behavior. And the only loogie I've ever hawked at a band member stuck on Bob's cheek. He, ne <laughs> he never, if he sees this, this will be the first he's ever known that it was from me. But it just like elongated on his cheek. You know, I don't even know if he realized that it was there, but it was, it was so not punk. <laughs> Grant's Loogie. Grant's one Loogie. Yeah, which uh, it would probably be a new band to play in the entry very soon. Yeah, and if they want to be emo, it's up to them. I think that works. Yeah. Well, Grant, I think on that we're going to call it a day. Yeah. Well, it's always Grant. it's always a pleasure to come down and talk for you. Yeah. Well, no, thanks for coming in. This was this was terrific. <laughs> it's the North and South meet. The <laughs>